conversations across um, the divides between linguistics and social science is really important. Um, Jonathan has mainly worked in the framework of, of governmentality and, and uh, published a book on varieties of resilience in, in that context, but also something on well-being, resilience and sustainability. Um, so we are very excited to have him here. And without further ado, uh, I pass on the floor to you. Great. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, it be very interesting because of the, for the reasons you've just said, the, the interdisciplinarity of this, to see how well this works. So on the face of it, if you look at my title and the mention of liberal international order, it looks like I'm an international relations scholar. Um, but I, I, there are many caveats to that. I've kind of ended up in international relations by accident. And um, <clears throat> I, I don't know, now people say, well, why don't you go and do sociology or philosophy? But I, actually, I think the main interesting questions in the world are to do with international relations. Um, but my approach to it is different from the kind of mainstream IR approaches. And you'll see throughout this presentation, perhaps you'll see, um, that there tends to be this divide between a realist and a liberal approach to international relations, which I don't buy into at all. Uh, so my approach is much more sociological and hopefully that will come across in the presentation. So or, although it looks like this is IR, I think there's a lot enough um, cross-disciplinarity cross to this, um, hopefully to keep the audience uh, on board. Uh, OK, so um, resilience, sustainability and crisis of international order. What does that mean? Is that, that's almost like an essay in itself. Um, so my main speciality, as you just heard, is, is on resilience. Um, but I did write uh, a co-author the book on uh, resilience, sustainability and well-being and how these represent a new um, uh, trinity of governance. Uh, and as also mentioned, my kind of take on governance is to do with Foucault and governmentality. So that will come out a little bit in the presentation. Um, but my caveat again is um, you've, you've kind of invited the wrong person to the wrong seminar because um, my speciality is much more in resilience and indeed when I co-authored the book my co-author did all the stuff on sustainability and um, on well-being and uh, being the expert there. Um, uh, so um, uh, I will try and talk as much as I can about sustainability and well-being, but um, I, I think hopefully when I'm talking about resilience, you'll see the connections with sustainability anyway. Um, I've also done some work on discourse. I edited a book on realism, discourse and deconstruction, which basically takes a, a philosophical realist approach to deconstruction and discourse analysis. And you'll know that there are quite strong connections between um, critical realism, scientific realism on the one hand as a philosophy, and critical discourse analysis on the other hand. So I've worked with people like Norman Fairclough and Bob Jessup uh, on those kinds of issues. Um, so hopefully that will also come out in some of the discussion. Um, although again, I'm not, my primary uh, identity is not as a discourse theorist either. Um, it, it's as a IR person who studies resilience. So let's see where we go with this. I've spent too long talking already about the framing of this, but um, you can push me in the questions if you want me to go into more detail about some of those connections. OK, so liberal international order and the various problems it currently faces. So if you read The Guardian or any kind of concerned newspaper, you'll know that the liberal international order is something about the kind of norms and values of international relations and that this is somehow in crisis and it's in crisis internally and externally because it's facing challenges from countries like China, which are not liberal countries, and it's faces, facing challenges from people like Donald Trump from within who are not liberal uh, uh, politicians. Um, so there's a questioning of liberalism and, but more importantly, the whole kind of institutional framework that was established after the Second World War, uh, which uh, we will call here the liberal international order. And this is not a term I've, I've invented. This is a mainstream IR uh, vocabulary. So it's, 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 there's a lot of debates at the moment in international relations on this theme. So the liberal international order, if you want to define it, according to the IR scholars like John Eikenbury, John Mearsheimer, others, is that it's um, it's this it's a universal has a universal basis uh, uh, defined in terms of democracy, multilateralism, international institutions, the rule of law, and liberal values. And you can unpack those different elements so we know what democracy is. It's also quite often liberal international order involves promoting democracy around the world, so democracy promotion as well as democracy in action, uh, multilateralism between different countries, 
um, reciprocity and interdependence of nation states, uh, international institutions which help to manage those that reciprocity. So the EU is the one I'm going to focus on here. Uh, but we could talk about NATO, we could talk about World Trade Organization, UN, all, all number of these institutions, the rule of law and following the rules and, 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 and the establishment of laws and treaties. And, and then most controversial, the liberal values which are associated with this order, which is where countries like China and uh, and other challenges start to part company with the US led international order because they don't buy into these values. So that's the the kind of definition, but then the other the other really important aspect of it is a security umbrella, which is definitely a Western oriented US led um, uh, security dimension where the US has two particularly important um, uh, security alliances, one with the EU and the other with Japan. Uh, but we know that this is proliferating now. So in the Asia Pacific as part of the um, the, the uh, Asian pivot, uh, the US has built up these new relationships like the Five Eyes, uh, AUKUS and the Quad. The Quad is the US, Japan, Australia and India. Uh, and they are explicitly anti-China alliances. Um, uh, and uh, the, this is part of the uh, security umbrella. So critics will say, you know, critics like Russia and China will see this for what it is. Um, now, the, the, this whole process is indica indicative of um, widespread anxieties which are now facing the liberal international order. And as I said, some of these threats come from without and some come from within. Um, so the rise of powerful non-liberal rivals, notably China, these threaten US primacy in the international order uh, and all the, the guarantee, all the guarantees that this order is meant to uh, provide for people. Um, so there's long term anxieties in terms of threats to US hegemony, by which I mean US leadership of this order. And, and if you follow the Gramscian line on hegemony, um, then this is not just that the US dominates the world order, but uh, it, it, it's able to persuade its main Western allies um, that it's a good thing to have this liberal international order. So that um, persuasion, that legitimacy of the order, that's now also under threat um, and um, there are real questions about whether this order can be uh, resilient and sustainable into the 20 further into the 21st century so the sustainability of the liberal international order is now a real question and the mainstream discussions in strategy documents and so on is about how to make this order more more resilient uh, in the context of instability so the liberal international order, just to reiterate, it, it faces not only these external threats, and I've mentioned China uh, as a main geopolitical rival, also, of course, Russia and what it's doing at the moment in Ukraine. These are clear uh, indications of geopolitical rivalries emerging post-Cold War for the first time properly. Uh, but also other external threats would be things like global pandemics. So I talk a bit about COVID here. Climate change obviously hangs over every everybody. Uh, but but also uh, uh, we need to emphasize the pressures coming from within. So I've mentioned Trump already. Uh, looks like he's probably going to get in next time round, which will have serious implications for the liberal international order's survival. Um, but also issues like Brexit, of course, far right populism. I should mention that here as well. Um, so far right populism is spreading across Europe. And if the um, far right does uh, as well as it's predicted to do in the next European elections, um, then that will be a major block to the EU's um, main sustainability program, Green Deal, among other things. So we, we also need to think about what course the EU will take if the far right is able to make these kinds of gains that it's predicted to make. So there's an open questioning of this uh, project, there's an open questioning of the things I mentioned above, multilateralism, democracy and liberal values. So. How can we then talk about the resilience of the international order, the liberal international order? So defenders of this order, and the most prominent of them is John Eikenbury. So anyone who reads IR will know John Eikenbury is the main liberal defender of the, of the liberal international order. Um, they recognise the problem. They recognise that this order is complex. It has many moving parts. It has many different logics. It has many different dynamics. It was built upon contradictions. So um, when people say it's a liberal international order, um, what about before 1945? Did this order exist? Was it created in 1945? Is it separate from or synonymous with um, US hegemony and US security alliances? 
or is there a more of a universalism to this order that goes beyond um, the US's immediate interests? In fact, the US makes sacrifices on behalf of these universal values. So there's these kinds of debates to be had about the liberal international order and its history. And of course, post-colonial scholars will point to the fact that liberalism was born out of empire uh, and that these dynamics have not gone away and it's still a grossly unfair uh, uh, dominant order of, of the global north. So all, all of these kinds of issues remain. They were concealed perhaps to a certain degree during the Cold War. Um, uh, but um, yeah, what, 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 what for some is a universal interest in the universal liberal principle uh, for someone else would just be simply a Western interest. So why should non-Western states buy into a liberal international order that only represents certain privileged few nation states? So these issues are really emerging post-Cold War. Um, people like Francis Fukuyama celebrated the end of the Cold War as the end of history, whereas we now know that this is the re revenge of history and the return of all these problems that had been concealed uh, under the bipolarity of Cold War politics. So this raises big issues uh, about the resilience and the sustainability of a whole institutional framework that was put into place post-1945. Uh, and the question is really, is it still fit for purpose? And that's what everybody's asking, not just the critics, but also people like Eikenbury who defend the liberal international order. Uh, so the liberal international order uh, is um, described as resilient by its defenders because uh, people still need the rules and the norms and the institutions in order to provide guarantees against uh, anarchy, basically, and that's the great uh, fear for liberals in the world system is that if you don't have some kind of set of rules and norms and institutions, you'll get anarchy or war of all against all. Uh, so the dark forces of world politics are uh, illiberalism, autocracy, nationalism, protectionism, various geographical spheres of interests breaking down and territorial revisionism taking place as we see in Ukraine. So um, uh, we need it, the Liberals would say, we still need this, we have to guarantee this, we, it has to be resilient, it has to be sustainable, um, but are these rules and norms, which as I say were formed uh, primarily in the 19, early, well mid 20th century, are these enough to sustain um, uh, the order that we have today? And, and of course, you, you know, you, you don't, you, again, you only have to pick up Guardian to read the kind of debates that are happening, like, you know, the UN is, is not representative, especially not the Security Council. Uh, do we need Security Council reform or do we need something even more significant than that? Is the G20 which brings in um, uh, emerging countries um, and the BRICS and other new powers. Uh, is that sufficient to deal with these problems or other, other types of um, frameworks that are required? So um, are the rules and norms enough to sustain this? What are these rules and norms? Where do they come from? Who do they represent? And are, are they sufficient or do we need to rewrite the rules? What, what's China's attitude towards these rules? Is it largely playing from within the, the system at the moment, I think, which I think it is? Uh, or does it want a revisionist agenda, which is to tear up these these rules and establish its own um, set of rules? So, um, so those are the um, issues that IR people are facing. Luckily, I said I'm on the fringes of IR, so I don't need to worry about those questions. I'm going to leave those to John Eikenbrew and John Mearsheimer to debate. Um, uh, and as I said, I'm more interested in um, the kind of uh, more sociology of this and how it relates to uh, issues about people's uh, governing populations. That's what Foucault would say. It's about governance is about how you govern populations. So um, I think as well as focusing, obviously, you still need to focus on the geopolitical context, the rivalries and so on that threaten the order, because that provides the, the background to all of this. Um, but how does that then reflect on societies and people and the ways in which they're governed? Uh, and um, you know, in, if you look at it in Foucauldian terms, I guess you'd say, how, how does that relate to go governmentality at various levels, global governmentality, but also governmentality at a societal level and indeed at an everyday level? And in, in fact, if you want to br break it right down to the individual, then there's still the question here would be, um, how are people encouraged to take care of themselves? under these conditions of international insecurity and uncertainty. So it's interesting to look at how this filters all the way down into everyday uh, politics. So um, so for me, the real question is, is not whether um, China is going to be able to challenge the US. Of course, we're all interested in that. But um, uh, the, the, the issue for me is a slightly different one, which is uh, how are we going to live with this new understanding of the liberal international order, order and all of the uncertainties that uh, are now uh, revealing themselves. And um, uh, it's not just me who's asking these questions. You don't need to be a paid up sociologist or Foucauldian or, or critic of the order to ask these questions. 
Um, the IR debates are lagging as usual. Um, there's many jokes about international relations. It's like a, someone said it's like an antiquated fairground attraction where the the appeal of it is it's like 20 years out of date, but it creates a sense of nostalgia and people are like, oh, were they really talking about those issues in those days? Uh, we've moved on to all these new theories by now. And, and the, 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 so the problem with IR is it's not really moved on to a lot of these newer, newer theories to discuss these issues. Um, it's still locked into debates about real, is it a realist system where it's power politics or a liberal system which is about cooperation. Um, so I'm more interested in the kind of government governance side of this. Now it's you, how these debates are actually used to govern people in their in their everyday lives. And um, it, it's interesting that although the the academics haven't really caught on to this, um, the policymakers have. So if you look at most of the uh, main uh, strategy papers coming out, um, both. Well, it's, it could be national security strategies, uh, country based, or it could be the EU security strategy, or it could be uh, uh, other other documents produced by various governments around the world. They are incorporating these debates uh, about uh, how we live with a new understanding of a liberal international order. Um, so um, in particular, the evidence of this is the proliferation of these three terms that I've called the new trinity of governance which are resilience, sustainability and well-being. And um, uh, we've argued, Alistair McGregor and I argued in this book, where we, we, we rushed it out as quick as we could to say that we've come up with this idea that this is a new trinity of governance. You better say this now before everybody else starts to catch on to it. Um, but I, I do see more and more evidence now in, among the um, the, the strategy papers and other documents of international organisations and governments that um, these are the three concepts that are going to help us to live with this crisis uh, and that they tend to go together as I'll, as I'll show you. But, but I, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I do focus a lot more on resilience here um, rather than the other two. So how do resilience, um, in, uh, sustainability and well-being give meaning uh, to the new challenges that we're facing uh, and how um, do they give meaning to the challenges being faced at all levels? So the levels of states, levels of institutions, the level of society, the level of communities, the level of individuals. Uh, how does um, governance work under these conditions? Uh, how does the promotion of resilience, sustainability and well-being encourage particular uh, form of governance as a response to this perceived crisis of liberal international order and, and all of the other crises that that, that entails? So I mentioned already um, environment, I mentioned uh, uh, geopolitical rivalries, pandemics, um, uh, legitimacy crises, uh, economic crisis, don't forget the financial crisis looms large over all of us. Uh, so uh, while the, um, the liberal international order and its crises provide a major headache for military strategists and other policy makers, it does actually provide new opportunities for rethinking uh, in order to better govern populations by encouraging a new set of responsibilities in this age of uncertainty and that's that's basically my Foucauldian contribution if you like. So resilience, sustainability and well-being are the new trinity of governance and they are so because they resonate in terms of their claims to address some of the most significant challenges we've, we've been facing and this is post um, economic crisis really so 2008 where these crises like the financial crisis and pandemic uh, revealed the inadequacy of current governance arrangements and mainstream policy approaches. Uh, and we know that this era could be um, considered to be a neoliberal age, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, and um, we know that these crises have exposed neoliberalism and its shortcomings. Um, so uh, as a, an attempt to try to overcome some of those difficulties that neoliberal forms of governance are facing, resilience has emerged in the face of this adversity, trying to build uh, uh, build resilience into the system so it doesn't have these kind of crisis moments. Uh, building sustainable futures, promoting well-being in order to cope with these challenges that emerge. What, what I think is important in all of these terms is that they, they, they capture something intangibly human in their emphasis. And that's what neoliberalism was missing. It, it missed this intangibly human element. It was very much about cold rational calculation, about profit margins and short term delivery. Um, and profits, and it missed out on the you know what do people do when they face a crisis? Uh, what kind of resources do they draw on, which cannot be reduced to uh, capital resources or financial capital or economic capital? So um, 
so these these issues I think became uh, have become really important in terms of crisis policy and how people think through living with disasters and, and crises. Uh, but of course, uh, it, all, there's a caveat to all of this. So while the concepts are pre presented in a positive way, because it, who, who could possibly be against the idea of resilience, sustainability and well-being? It's something that has all of these kind of positive uh, connotations to them. Um, whilst they, they, they are presented in a positive manner as eminently desirable qualities and objectives, uh, all of this is dependent upon the context being one of laden with uncertainty, unpredictability, and tangible existential threats. So that's the uh, backdrop to all of this. So I've argued that this represents a form of governmentality, that neoliberal governance operates through processes of individualization, use of market mechanisms, uh, and the responsibilizing of human conduct to make to, to encourage self-governance effectively. And that resilience, sustainability, and well-being uh, fit very well with this because they're about calling upon people to be more reflective and more responsible in their behavior. This particularly took off after the 2008 financial crisis to fill gaps, as I mentioned, in neoliberal thinking and add a new human dimension to our understanding of governance and responsibilities that we have to one another. Um, so it's been utilized in response to the pandemic because clearly the logic of neoliberal thinking was seen as deficient materially in terms of inadequacy of healthcare and equipment. Uh, but also in terms of the kind of dialogue that came out. The discourse is, was an, a, a very callous discourse in terms of herd, herd immunity and allowing the most vulnerable to die. Um, so this new trinity works as a way to try to reboot crisis thinking. It works as a, di in a, discursive, as a discursive tool to reboot crisis thinking uh, and to add this intangibly human element to overcome the limits of instrumental rationality and the neoliberal market logic. Um, okay. So uh, I'm just I'm trying to make sure the slides change. So uh, all of that is discursive in my view. So I'm kind of saying that don't worry about the geopolitical rivalries. Don't, it doesn't matter that much whether it's going to be China or America who comes out on top here. Of course it does. Uh, but the discourse has a kind of life of its own as well. But, you know, dis discourses don't even have to be true uh, as long as they operate in a certain way to encourage certain types of behaviour. However, uh, you know, I'm a, a scientific realist, so I do believe that there are limits to discourse. Um, and um, and so uh, I've tried to address here some of the some of the ways in which crisis discourse works to encourage a particular approach to governance and ways of thinking and encourage different types of behaviour. But we see the limits of this all of the time. Um, so um, uh, there is a kind of bottom line uh, materiality, I think, that sets limits to how these discourses can work and how far you can go with this a crisis discourse. Um, so real developments uh, going on in the international system out there, regardless of how we talk about them, um, the US is in decline. You can document that materially and it's not just a discursive construct. Um, the, 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 the climate change is taking place, whatever we say about it and whatever discourses we try to um, uh, create around it. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic as well really showed the limits of discourse. So. Um, uh, I mean, Trump tried to claim that it wasn't really a serious problem. And at the same time, uh, you could clearly see from mortality rates that there are limits to what he could say that people would believe um, uh, uh, if if um, all the indications are otherwise. So um, so I'm interested in that interplay, I guess, between discourse and reality, uh, what Bratton's called the great revealer, that um, crisis events actually show themselves to be great revealers uh, because they interrupt the discourse and show the discourse to be uh, uh, inadequate in explaining what people can see uh, is, is, is different from what, what how it's being described. So I think that's a very interesting dynamic um, to go into. So um, the other attraction of um, concepts like resilience, sustainability and well-being is that they can work at all levels. So they provide all the kind of necessary connections from the top to the bottom. So we're talking about making international institutions more resilient, making rules, rules and norms of the international system sustainable. But we're also talking about um, individuals acting as uh, more responsible actors, uh, thinking about others in their behaviour and, and, and thinking about their own well-being. So it operates at all levels. And, and this is, of course, the attraction of such concepts that they are multi-scalar, I guess you could say. Uh, however, that presents big problems in terms of um, uh, where this takes us, because um, it inevitably produces tensions, I think, in terms of where the focus should be. 
Uh, we have more continental ideas, and um, I find that particularly when I look at EU discourse, more continental ideas in terms of societal resilience, a whole of society approach, social solidarity, which you'll see a lot in um, EU documents, uh, and then uh, more Anglo-Saxon notions of uh, individual responsibility and self-governance. Don't forget the British, Margaret Thatcher, who said there's no such thing as society. Um, and it's definitely the case that um, if you read resilience discourse in the US and the UK, um, it's it's very much based on private sector and individual responsibility. So that makes, means a, an issue because if the EU is going to adopt this discourse of resilience, um, then um, there's a clash between uh, the universalism of its own classical liberal values, which it promotes as a normative power, and the more pragmatic approach of neoliberalism, which is not universal. So this is then being incorporated into national security strategies. Since I don't have huge amounts of time, I'll, I'll skip that one. And, but but it, you can have a look at the slides if you, you get a chance. Um, uh, how they're starting to include these approaches in their arguments. Um, but this next slide also represents the same argument that um, it's being built into international institutions now. Um, that um, we're talking about the importance of sustainable and resilient international institutions and rules. We're talking about how organisations like the EU and NATO, and if you look at NATO, you'll see the same kind of arguments that you'll see in the EU documents, how they see their identity bound up with defence of a liberal international order, its rules and its norms, but also how they're looking for purpose uh, and a continuation of a project which they recognise as being uh, under considerable pressure. So um, how do these different organisations incorporate resilience and sustainability into their global governance agenda? How, well be, how is well-being incorporated, for example, through things like the Sustainable Development Goals? Um, uh, and, uh, but also, uh, what sort of things do we need to question? So the more that resilience and sustainability and well-being enter into the international agenda, the more actually, paradoxically, there's a questioning of some of the things that have traditionally been committed to, such as um, democracy promotion, human rights, and other what are seen as being overly ambitious liberal international interventions. Uh, we know that the liberal internationalists got their fingers burnt in the 1990s when they thought that they could do all kinds of humanitarian interventions which all went badly wrong. Uh, and the service is partly responsible for this pragmatic turn away from liberal universalism towards um, basing your interventions on your own strategic interests. So, uh, if you look at, say, EU documents on this, then resilience thinking definitely represents a shift from universal liberal values to a more pragmatic approach. Uh, and this is in line with the uh, challenges I mentioned already, geopolitical rivalries. Why, why would you go and promote resilience, sustainability and well-being around the globe when you really need to be concentrating on what's going on on your borders and making those societies more resilient um, for, for geo, geostrategic reasons? So. Um, so these, these kinds of issues are uh, emerging in the discourse. So I, I pick up a case study here. Uh, I look at the EU um, and um, I, uh, I realised I've got the wrong slides up here. They, they work very well until this point. And then uh, I've got the draft version here. That's why you can see some black typing. But since I'm running out of time, I think that's, that's not a problem. Um, so the study of uh, resilience in the EU, uh, we argue in this case study, um, shows that it's now turning in on itself. And so this is a, an interesting discursive shift, I think we can note, that the concept began as a very ambitious concept. It began as a way of trying to encourage different actors to show responsibility, to act in a dynamic way, to look for opportunities, to be entrepreneurial in their way of tackling disasters and crises, and to turn disadvantage to advantage. So that's consistent, in my view, with a, a neoliberal mentality. It's a way of profiting from uh, uh, opportunities that might present themselves uh, and it's an individualistic approach which says that we work better when we work as private sector individuals as as, uh, as private corporations and that we try to limit the role of the state um, so uh, that discourse uh, has incorporated itself into the EU's uh, various strategies and the EU is looking for different ways of of doing things um, but with it comes a whole set of connotations which are problematic for the EU because it's tried to set itself up as a normative actor that does universal liberal, thing, liberal things. Um, so um, the appeal of resilience initially was that it could, it, it could represent a, a kind of ambiguous 
um, way of uh, thinking about new challenges. It, it, you didn't have to, it, if you said you were thinking about resilience, you didn't need to commit yourself to a particular way of thinking about the world. Um, it could mean all things to all people, depending on who those people were. So deliberately introduced into EU strategy as a way to bring different groups together so that the UK at that time would be thinking in terms of um, individual responsibility, the private sector, uh, and, and neoliberal forms of, of governance, whereas the Germans would see resilience as uh, a, a societal resilience, robustness and um, uh, protection. Uh, the French would see resilience as a form of social solidarity. Um, and the Germans and the French would link it in much more closely with uh, sustainability, I guess. So um, uh, it was deliberately done that this uh, concept emerged as a way uh, to um, uh, uh, create a, a degree of ambiguity, deliberate ambiguity, in order to try to bring all these different actors in the EU together. And so uh, we can see various tactics here being deployed. Uh, one, one option might be to try and fix a meaning to contested ideas. Uh, another would be to increase the fuzziness and the ambiguity of concepts like resilience uh, in order to fend off challenges. And the third one would be to actually the opposite of that, to reduce the idea to a buzzword or a common sense framework so that we don't have any challenges and, and that it becomes very um, uh, straightforward in its meaning. Now, our argument, um, my argument, is that in the face of all the uncertainty that we face, um, that resilience has actually shifted from being an ambiguous concept to being uh, a fixed concept, a descriptive concept, even a buzzword. Uh, and that was a kind of paradox, I think, because the more that the term is being used today, the less it actually means. Um, that um, uh, although it's emerged in quite an exciting way in EU discourse uh, in earlier strategy approaches, um, in the face of all these significant challenges uh, of recent years, it's uh, reverted back to being a very uh, boring, uh, commonsensical uh, framing of um, the problems that the EU faces. And that is because the EU, as well as other international organisations who are doing the same sorts of things, uh, cannot afford to have this kind of degree of ambiguity anymore um, in, in the face of um, various uh, new existential challenges. So, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a scholar of resilience, I thought it was quite exciting at first to think that um, resilience was emerging as um, this new concept, that, uh, you know, proliferating uh, as a new idea in EU thinking. Um, but I, I soon realised that um, actually um, the more it's being used, uh, the less it's actually saying. Uh, and so um, uh, it, it, if you read EU documents now, you'll see that resilience is everywhere in that, in that discourse. Um, but that it, it really doesn't get much beyond being a descriptive term. So that's uh, the kind of broad um, discursive shift I think I, I wanted to argue for. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, to flip through here to find out. Yeah, I've really come up with the wrong, <laughs> with the wrong slide here. Um, I guess I could stop sharing. Maybe that would make more sense. I, I don't know how much more time I should go on for, though, because we need to leave time for questions, shouldn't we? So maybe what I, what I could do is I could stop at this point. Um, should I stop? Maybe have some questions and then I can maybe try and find uh, the conclusion slide, which uh, would uh, give me a chance to sum up some of these arguments and put it up on the screen. So yeah, maybe I'll stop at this point and then um, I can go back and look for some more slides if we need them.